But first, let's uh, give a, a vote of gratitude uh, that we can be here at the Crown Klein Center because of the generosity of the College of Central Florida, and especially because of Dr. Rob Wolf, Dean of Technology and Workforce. The food we've been enjoying was sponsored by the Humanist of North Central Florida and Olin Women's International. Uh, and we thank all who have volunteered their time to bring this evening to us. As you guys know, tonight you're going to have an opportunity to, to have a candid conversation. And when you're candid, you're real. So I want you to be real with the people at your table. You know, Be sincere. Be open. So there's a quote that I found by Holly Selassie, and I thought it was very appropriate to tonight's discussion. Throughout history, it has been the inaction of those who could have acted, the indifference of those who should have known better, the silence of the injustice when it mattered most that has made it possible for evil to chime. So we're essentially inviting you to be in action, to take action, you know, to change the state that's going on, of the situation that's going on here in the United States. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Amira. Uh, so the Bridges Project of Marion County and Ocala began in January 2015 a result of a forum about race relations that month and a conversation that followed that. I've been a part of Bridges ever since that. Uh, and three years ago, or almost three years ago, in this very room, many of you were here as we watched the film Racial Taboo and had small group conversations following that. Uh, we got a little more organized tonight. And so if you remember what it was like then, we, we pr probably weren't terribly organized as we tried to do conversations around that film. And so you're at tables with a facilitator. Uh, there will be time for you to each be heard as well as to speak. And your facilitator is trained to, uh, and they're wearing those wonderful teal armbands. You can recognize them at your table. Uh, and so that's what we're about this evening. Uh, but as we want to set the stage, Amira and I just met back in September. Uh, I was speaking at uh, one of the uh, Master the Possibilities evenings about race relations, and Amira was there. Yes. Um, I found out about the event on a fluke uh, via an email. And when I went, I didn't know what to expect, but there were three speakers on the stage. And one of the speakers was Reverend Peggy. And her words just moved me. And it made me feel comfortable. And I realized that there are people in Ocala who care, who want to change this place. So um, I was inspired to get involved with Bridges because of her talk. Thank you. So let's set the stage for what we will be doing. Um, okay, the mission of, of Bridges is to, oh, this is yours, the mission for tonight. That's yours, Amira. Yes. Um, our mission for tonight is to, is to provide an environment where we can share diverse viewpoints, learn from each other, and experience new ideas in a constructive, respectful, emotionally safe, and open manner. And during this program, we hope to engage in civil discussion, respectful dissent, empathetic acknowledgement, and non-judgmental problem solving as a community of learners. You guys got this. You can do it. <laughs> and we had some guidelines. And they're in the front of your program. And they also were coming up on the screen for our group conversations. So our guidelines for sharing, the first one is sharing is voluntary and can be difficult, but it is expected for the process of learning. The next one is we want to create a safe, loving, and respectful atmosphere, and it's up to us to do that. Sharing is about one's own feelings, experiences, perceptions, and beliefs. We're not always going to agree or see everything the same way, and that's okay. Each person has a right to and responsibility for his or her own feelings, thoughts, and beliefs. It's important to avoid criticism or judgment or anyone and tends to ultimately inhibit the sharing. 
We can only change ourselves. Our change and growth may, however, inspire someone else. Refrain from singling out any individual as representing his or her group or issue. It's important to give full attention to whoever is talking. We will surely make mistakes in our efforts, but mistakes are occasions for learning and forgiving. And we can come together to try to learn about the disease of racism and promote a healing process. We may laugh and cry together, share pain, joy, fear, or anger. Feelings are important. Hopefully we will lead these meetings with a deeper understanding and a renewed hope for the future of humanity. In order to provide a safe environment for sharing, we agree that any personal stories and feelings shared here are in confidence and stay within this room. And that's based on healing racism. Uh, okay, so we're going to practice something first, and uh, Mary and I are going to model it for you. It's just an icebreaker. And the icebreaker is something I'd really like you to know about me is. A group of longtime culturally diverse friends gathered together to unwind after a long week of challenges with work, family, and news headlines. They discovered something new. Hey, let's listen. I so needed this. Tonight, ladies, it looks like it's going to be the great last night. <laughs> Seriously, between our families, uh, what's going on in the news, they would drive you to drink. <laughs> Yes, it would. Ladies, I am with you. But tonight, I am going to stick to Diet Pepsi. <coughs> Gotta watch the calories. But I still need to unwind with you ladies, though. So true. Me, I say, pour the wine and let's unwind. <laughs> I've got plenty on hand. They had a big sale at the barnyard. And you know what? I stopped up. <laughs> hmm. You may have been watching the news lately. Did you see this story about Starbucks where they called the cops on these young men just for sitting and waiting for a friend? Did you guys hear about that? What? That's just crazy. I know. Since when is it a crime <laughs> to sit in a public place and wait for someone else? All they wanted to do was have a meeting. That was just so unfair. I agree. It makes me so mad that people are profiled. That if this, now you've got to be that if you're a female. It's nonsense. Ladies, ladies, this is why we stay home and drink wine for night <laughs> Pepsi. That's why I'm going out for coffee, right? Yeah? Mm-hmm. Uh, Tisha? Uh, I know you have got to have something to say about this mess. You're acting like your body's here, but your mind's somewhere else. You've only had half a glass of wine, so I know it is not the wine. Come on. We are friends, aren't we? Just talk to us. We are always here for each other. Take a load off your shoulder and just talk to us, okay? Well, you can chalk up that incident and all the other incidents like it, like Bobby Becky, Cool Patrol Paula, you know those, to one simple thing. That's just what it's like living in color. Living in color, that 90s program with white <laughs> 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 Oh, I love that show. It was so funny. Oh, Lily. <laughs> no, no, no. She doesn't mean the 90s TV show that was a great show, though. She means that's, that's what it's like for anyone who basically 
isn't white. I mean, you know, like living in color, or maybe living as a color. You know, that's sad, but that's just how people treat you. I know what she means. I'm Latina, and I'm not exactly light, so I catch my fair share of crap for it. so much worse. We have a saying, for God's sake, driving while black, living while black, all the BS we have to put up with in everyday life. Well, I, I don't understand. I mean, just because you aren't white, that you look differently, that you're not only treated differently, but treated worse? Mm -hmm. In 2019 America? Are you kidding? Oh, uh, she's not kidding. This has been going on forever and ever and ever to blacks, to Latinos, help to anybody who isn't white. And you know what it is? Now with social media, right? We've all got our phones, we're all recording everything, so now it's in your face and it can't be denied. Well, I hate this. I think with the climate in America right now, the blacks and the Latinos get the worst of it. <clears throat> People think that you are a very dangerous criminal or an illegal alien trying to take away the American jobs. That's what they think. Exactly. I mean, really. You would never get harassed for being in a certain department store just lingering and looking at merchandise. Or get pulled over by cops and ask if you're a citizen and detained. I hate this. I hate all of it. Why does it have to be this way? Why are people so afraid of each other? So hateful of each other? Oh, I feel awful about all of this. You know what, we all hate it. We, we all hate it. It is beyond unfair. In fact, it is downright shameful. But you know what? That's just the way it is, and some things don't ever change. Just because that's the way it is doesn't mean that's the way it's got to be. No, well, I'm still living and breathing. Then yeah, what can we do to change it? Just what we're doing now, talking about it. People don't usually talk about it. It's the elephant in the room. Everyone acts as if they're colorblind and don't see it. No one is colorblind. But what we need to do is step up and be color brave. Color? And, yeah, and maybe, you know, wine kind of helped a little bit too. <laughs> color brave? term that I heard on TED Talk by Melody Hobson. I watch it on YouTube. You know Melody Hobson, the wife. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, she happens to be uh, black and beautiful. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow! Color brain! Now that is an incredible concept. I personally appreciate color, especially red. <laughs> Looks like you're out of line. We're out of line. Already. Yeah. 
I'll have another Diet Pepsi. I'm still on my diet. Color brave. I like that. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to make a toast to color brave allies. Hmm. To being color brave allies. We invite you to be celebrated. To start tonight with the folks at your table, let the candid conversations begin. Sometimes it's hard to know the right thing to do, especially when you're caught off guard. Here we share a contributor's personal post about just that from Tanahashi Coates Atlantic Magazine series. She and I were on a date in downtown Syracuse about a month ago. We were going to listen to some amateur mu musicians at the Main Street Cafe. It was a really fun time. <laughs> we decided afterwards to take a walk through downtown. After a brief stop at Starbucks, we kept walking around downtown. It was a Sunday. The streets were deserted. We were holding hands, enjoying ourselves. At some point, three black boys, probably high schoolers, were walking behind us. We didn't pay them any mind until we distinctly heard them say, yo, she darker than he is. <laughs> My girlfriend and I kind of looked at each other, trying to affirm that we heard what we thought we heard. We kept walking. Then one of them said, what color your baby going to come out? We didn't respond. We didn't look back. We just kept walking. Hey, I said, what color your baby going to come out? By then, it was perfectly clear they were no longer talking about us, but at us. Now, we're no strangers to racial harassment. It's usually some white guy walking down the street in the opposite direction, making a quick remark and vanishing before he can respond. Or it's some stationary drunk guy with a beer in his hand leaning against a structure of some sort. Often, I just give him a finger and leave it at that. <laughs> this incident, however, was the first experience where our harassers were actually following us. We whispered to each other about what to do. Keep walking, turn around and confront them, what if it led to a fight? What if one of them was carrying a weapon of some kind? We're not very confrontational people, but we hadn't prepared for this. We both sort of committed to stepping up our pace a little bit, but we pretended we couldn't hear them. The same sentence, what color your baby going to come out? We shouted again and again, while these boys followed about 30 feet behind us for three blocks. At one point, I heard the phrase, Black bitch aimed at my girlfriend, in which I definitely felt her tense up on my arm. She clearly wanted to turn around and punch them. Once again, I didn't know what to do. Keep walking or confront them. We came to an intersection. We saw a bunch of people gathered around the building down the street to the right. So we turned to walk in that direction. The trio of youths apparently decided not to keep following us, now there was more than two of us, and they just kept walking to another street. My girlfriend was shaking from fear, from anger, from anger at herself for not confronting them, even anger at me and I was also shaking. We had a long conversation about it. I was angry at myself for not saying something to those boys, particularly when they called her a black bitch. That struck me as odd. The boys never really said anything about me. I can count on one hand the number of live, the number of times I've been called a cracker, which I honestly can't find offensive. It sounds silly, like being called a saltine or a ritz. <laughs> Most other anti-white slurs never offended me either. Honky, 
That's a sound a car horn makes. <laughs> Heck of wood. It goes without saying, I find that hilarious rather than offensive. Now, I'm not exactly naive to the issues of institutional racism. Recklessness by the Syracuse police has resulted in deaths of people like Shawnice Patterson or Raul Panay Jr., as well as the maiming of an African immigrant named Maparo Ramadan. About two years ago, I witnessed a black student getting arrested and thrown to the ground downtown at a bus terminal just for refusing to get off the bus. He was trying to get home on the last day of school, and his bus pass, which was working in the morning, wasn't working that afternoon for some reason. A black woman even offered $2 from her own pocket to pay for the boy's fare, to which the officer said, shut the fuck up and sit down. Had I a camera, I would have recorded that incident. I suppose the final thing that worried my girlfriend and me was the implications of those three U's regarding our having children. If we did have children, how would they be treated by other black folks? How would they be treated by the police? How would they be treated by white people? That's what scares me the most. As a white person raised in a 99% white environment, I never had to deal with issues of race for the first 20 years of my life. I've never had this talk my black acquaintances refer to. So the thought of us having a child together and my restricted ability to help our child scares the crap out of me. It also concerns my girlfriend that despite her being a black woman, she might not know how to raise a biracial child in this society. We've discussed how to deal with other following harassment incidents. We've discussed all the pros and cons of simply walking on or confronting any future harassers. Still, the fear that we're not prepared is there. If something like this happened to you, how would you handle the situation? Would you walk on? Walk and ignore it? Turn around? Confront it? Or? Let's turn to the folks at our table and have the next conversation. Getting a driver's license is a coming of age milestone for every teenager. Not all families have to address this important step in way. I can't believe you're old enough to get your learner's permit. <laughs> so you're growing up. Feels like just yesterday you were learning to walk. And now you're beginning to learn to drive. Son, this is a big deal. You being old enough to get your permit, you've been pretty quiet about it, but I've been waiting for the day I won't have to run all over creation for every little thing. You know, I'm not your Uber driver. <laughs> now we can probably let you drive back and forth to school and get some practice in before we set you up for the driver's test. And about that cell phone, when you are driving, you will not touch your phone. Never. Not even when I'm calling you. <laughs> Just leave it alone and call me back. <coughs> and you know all those friends you hang out with after school? Mm -hmm. Well, they're going to have to find their own ride home. Because one minute, one minute, one little bit of pushing around and getting your eyes off the road, it only takes a second. Now, make sure you know what route you are taking before you start out. You don't want to end up somewhere where you're not supposed to be. What's that supposed to mean? You know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> now, somebody starts bothering you on the road, you know, pulling in front of you, slamming their brakes, tailgating, or want to race you with the light. You can always drive to the nearest police station and report it. The police will help you out don't try to be a hero and handle it on your own. But Dad, I can handle it. You know, road rage is real. Unfortunately, the police 
are not your friend. <laughs> you have been born with a bullseye on your backside. You're young, you're black, and you're a male. Now I, Those are three strikes against you. Now I expect you to follow the speed limit at all times. But just in case you get pulled over, make sure you have your driver's license with you every time you get into the car. The registration and insurance card are usually in the glove box in case you're in an accident. If you get pulled over, keep your hands in the officer's view and on the steering wheel at all times. Keep your eyes forward. Do not look that officer in the eye. No sudden movements. Do you think I would be able to have my license by the time prom comes? Well, don't worry about that right now. Um, just keep reading the driver's ed book and learn all those rules of the road. Now, wouldn't it be cooler to rent a limo anyway? Yeah. If the officer asks you for your license and registration, tell the officer you're going to move your hands so that you have to reach into your glove box to get your registration. And move slowly! This is going to be so awesome. I'll be able to drive to the beach anytime I want. Now, now wait a minute, don't get too excited. Remember, no sudden movements. You don't want that cop to think you're going for a gun. A gun? Son, that's just the way we have to do things. Nobody said it's fair. After I get that job that Randall's dad promised me, I am putting away every penny until I can buy that Mustang. You're pretty quiet. Are you getting all of this? It just, just seems that you're so angry, eh? Son, either I can beat you or the police can beat you. Maybe I can get one orange fury. That's going to be me, the fast and the furious. How about the slow and the cautious? <laughs> I actually don't want to drive. <laughs> what do you mean you don't want to drive? Every teenager can't wait to get their license and get out on the road on their own. It's freedom. It's a rite of passage. Dad, I watch the news. I know how it is. I, I know how this goes down. I don't think I ever want my license. I'm so sick. I have a license and drive. I'm actually scared. There's a part of me that wants a car but the other part, I, I don't want it if I could die. This was the same topic. Focus on the safety behind the wheel. <laughs> but two and target different approaches and conversations. There are things as a white parent you would never, ever think about doing or saying to your child. Unfortunately, there are things as a parent of color. You must take your time. Our final performance is the passionate and powerful signature poetry piece, Another Pill to Swallow, straight from the heart and mind of Amara Sims. I feel so hollow inside because it's like no one understands my plight. The words I write, they don't bring life to the emotions that are bottled up inside. If I speak, I'm heard, but when I try to speak, my words escape me and my voice can't bring forth the fruits of my thoughts. Am I lost? When I left the house the other day, my man said to me, beat them off with a bat. And I was like, yeah, right. I can't see why he thinks I'm a walking beauty because I'm so concerned about the state of my inner beauty. I have a hard time demanding respect because I lack the desire to be overly aggressive. But that's my problem. The words that are in my heart, they're full of power. They need a voice to give them their due. But when I try to speak, my words escape me and my voice can't bring forth the fruits of my thoughts. Am I lost? A long time ago, I worked with an old man that had 75 years under his belt. And he swallowed 13 pills daily, this is true. But those 13 pills ain't nothing like the pills I have to swallow, see? Because society tells me to open up my mouth and open up wide. But I say, open up your minds. You and I, we're part of the generation that is asked to accept the possible reality of the double discovery of the missing link between man and ape. You and I, we're part of the generation that is asked to associate the word breast with sex and not with baby. 
We're supposed to teach our children about Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny, the tooth fairy in one breath, and tell them not to lie in the next. No disrespect, but you and I, we're part of the generation that is asked to believe that 911 was the greatest tragedy of all times. Like this was the first time innocent lives were lost. But what about the mass genocide that has systematically destroyed a population of people? What about the murder of millions of brown-eyed brothers and sisters whose bones are at the bottom of some ocean somewhere? And how about the Native Americans that have been reduced to reservations in the names of professional baseball teams? And let's not forget to mention the Tuskegee experiment, where for the sake of science, this so-called civilized nation embraced inhumane acts and justified as being for the sake of humanity. So fortunate for some and unfortunate for others, you reap what you sow. When we sow seeds of discord, we reap the Oklahoma bombing, we reap the Columbine shooting, when we sow seeds of racial inequality, we pump up the idea of America, the great civilized society. We reap police brutality. We reap the Amadou Diallo's. We reap the nameless inner city so-called bad boys whose only claim to fame is the cars they drive, the girls they screw, and the jail time that made them hard. Yes, yeah, hard to swallow. It's hard to swallow the statistical ratio of black men in jail compared to college. But I guess that's just another pill, right? So it's not that I'm arrogant, and it's not that I'm shy. It's that I see this world through a different set of eyes. And sometimes I feel like it's me and my view, and then there's everyone else. But I know that as people who feel me, if you're a woman, your worth, your value as a person isn't determined by how sexy you are. And it's not just about talking about being strong, should flies and actions. Speaking lip service to preach my appetite for recognition doesn't make me strong. No, my strength comes from supporting my man. My strength comes from raising my boys to be real men. My strength comes from not being intimidated, intimidated by the, being the only African American in my program and spent the time. My strength is expressed in my unwillingness to bow down to the conditions of work the American society places on me. Because I don't have to be first and I don't have to be last. My hair don't have to be straight and my nails don't need to be painted. My college degrees aren't what makes me intelligent. I can think for myself and speak for myself. I can choose to swallow the pills placed before me or I can choose to push them aside. I can accept the responsibility of earning respect and I can strive to be beautiful inside and out. I can be Amira Hanifa Sims and that's okay. What we're going to ask now is a wrap up from the tables that would like to do that. And we have two mic runners, um, Amira on this side and Phyllis on this side. So those of you who are facilitators at a table that have someone at your table that would like to give a five word wrap up from your table, raise your green card and they'll come to you. Thank you, thank you. This is table 47. This is the greatest group in the world. There's so, so much insight, so much sharing. Very helpful. Thank you. Table 37. These conversations were badly needed. Elizabeth, uh, we're from group number 45. Woo! Um, but I have to say, I honestly came here for extra credit for Miss Sims psychology class. But I have to say, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and we had some amazing conversations. Don't be afraid to engage. Conversations and people. 
April 15, um, five words. Right here, right here. I'm sorry. Um, powerful, educational, eye-opening, exhilarating, um, and we need action. Table 16, let your voice be heard. Yeah. Table 14, we can make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Table 19, it was an, ex like an amazing experience to meet these new people and see these new ideas, and it was very eye opening. <laughs> Table 13, insightful, generous, awareness. Interesting, eye-opening camaraderie ship. Table 28. Together we make up the image of God. From table 15, I want to say I really heard their voice. Please keep it up. Uh, this is table number 24. And my sentence is, this is just the beginning. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. Table 8. Please keep it up because we're all worth it. Thank you. Peggy, we did a haiku. <laughs> Without dialogue, every, everybody stands all alone over there. So, table one, that goes without saying, we're number one. It's about damn time. <laughs> table six, in my Al Green voice, it's all about love and happiness. <laughs> Everything over here. 
Appreciating our diversity brings unity. your contribution, and we have to keep this conversation going. We have to keep this conversation going. If not for us, as we get older, the young people. We need to change the world's vibes. The global conversation needs to be about equality, equity. That's what makes us all citizens of this world. We are all human, and we forget that in our daily lives. So let's remember to treat each other with kindness and respect. Talk to each other. Tell each other how we feel. Share. It's just so important. Now, more than ever, the illusion of division threatens our very existence. We all know the truth. More connects us than separates us. But in time of crisis, the wise build bridges while the foolish build barriers. We must find a way to look after one another as if we were all one single tribe. Amen. So please keep that in mind. And now I am so happy to introduce to you the College of Central Florida's Chamber Choir performing the good song written by our very own Leslie Miller and D.O. Williams. Thank you. 